Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, is IQ important? So this is a good question. IQ stands for intelligence quotient, and it's theoretically a measure of intelligence. And there's a lot of controversy around this term. Is it important? Does it matter in any way? Does somebody need to know? their IQ. If you do know your IQ, how can that help you? So a lot of different questions, and as I mentioned, a lot of controversy and turmoil around this construct of IQ. So sometimes we hear that IQ is just a number, and I find this to be kind of a dismissive criticism of IQ. Understandable in a way, but what number isn't a number? It's just a way of minimizing the potential importance of IQ. But what evidence is there of importance or insignificance? If you look at some other numbers that are, of course, just numbers, look at age. All things being equal, if you had two people in front of you and somebody said, which person would you expect to live longer? So in the total number of years from the point in time that you're at now. If you knew their age, you would probably, again, all the things being equal, select the person who is younger. So age is important. Age does matter. There are consequences to being certain ages. If you're offered other information about those same two people, like what was their favorite color or what books have they read recently, you would still pick age. Age is important. How about speed? Speed's just a number, but if you're pulled over by the police going 15 miles over the speed limit, then they come to the door and you say, well, speed's just a number. My guess is most law enforcement officers would disagree with you. Or how about something like money? If you're trying to sell, say, a car, like a private sale, and you know it's worth about $2,000 and somebody offers you 20 bucks for it, and they say, well, it's just a number. So, yes, we deal with a lot of different numbers, but that automatically doesn't mean that they're not important. Some numbers we know are very important. So none of those items I mentioned, of course, are really only just numbers. They signify something important, so why would IQ be different? So the real challenge we see here with IQ, and the reason people say it's just a number, is the idea that it doesn't actually capture the construct of intelligence, or even if it does, intelligence doesn't matter. It doesn't predict anything. So to answer this question here, we first have to look at what is IQ. So IQ is a measurement, again theoretically, of intelligence. We call this the G factor, general cognitive ability. And there is no central agreed upon term in terms of what is intelligence. There is no agreement in terms of what the G factor really is. So IQ tests are all built in sort of an indirect fashion because there's no direct way to measure this construct. And they're mostly used to predict job performance and educational achievement. Some of the more popular IQ tests would be the WACE and the Stanford Binet. The WACE works pretty well toward the middle of the bell curve, if we think about the normal distribution, and the Stanford Binet works a little better toward the extremes, so low intelligence and high intelligence, theoretically. A lot of times when I talk to people and they mention their IQ, I ask them, well, where did you get that IQ score? They say, well, I took an online test, so one of these tests that takes 10 minutes or one minute or something like that. They're not reliable or valid, meaning they're not consistent, that's reliability, and they're not valid, meaning they don't actually capture the construct of intelligence. In order to get an IQ score that had any use or any predictive power, you'd have to have a WACE or a Stanford Binet or some other comparable instrument. And a lot of these instruments have been around a long time and been refined over many years as new data comes in. Now, IQ tests, even the good ones, don't perfectly measure intelligence. But we wouldn't expect to see a lot of error. So, for example, if someone's true IQ, which of course is unknowable, but if their true IQ was, say, 115, we wouldn't expect them to score an 80. We'd expect them to score maybe 110 or maybe 120 or something like that. So we would think that an IQ test would be somewhere near the true IQ score. So when I use these different scores, like 80 and 120, what does the score mean? What am I really talking about? Well, the principle of IQ is a normally distributed variable. So the measurement, the output, is normally distributed, which means it follows a bell curve. 
So we'd expect to see a lot of people kind of near the average IQ and few people that have really high IQs or low IQs. So not all variables in psychometric measurement. Those are measurements designed to capture some behavioral concept or cognitive concept. Not all of them are normally distributed. For example, look at the concept of age I mentioned before. Age is not normally distributed. You'd expect in any population to see roughly the same number of people that are 10 years old as you would 30 years old. Of course, as people age, there's an increased risk for mortality. But either way, it's not normally distributed. It's not perfectly uniformly distributed either, but it's not normal. IQ is normal. So in a sense, it's like height and weight and other characteristics we know tend to follow the bell curve. So to understand this construct a little better, I'm going to get briefly into the idea of standard deviation and percentile rank. So we know the average IQ is 100, and we know the standard deviation is 15. So here's what this means. If you have an IQ of 100, and you take away one standard deviation, that leaves you 85 points. If you add one standard deviation, that's 115. So what we know from this is that we'd expect 68% of the population to have an IQ between 85 and 115, within one standard deviation in each direction from the mean. Now if we move to the concept of percentile rank, what this means is this is the percent of the population that has a lower score than the score that you've received. So if you're given an IQ score, you're also given a percentile rank. So let's say that the IQ score is 115, again one standard deviation above the mean. Well we know that the mean, 100, that would be the 50th percentile. So if we move up to the first standard deviation, that would put on another 34 percent, half of that 68 percent I mentioned before. So that would mean that a score of 115 would be a score higher than 84 percent of the population. So how does this fit in with some different populations that have been studied in research? Well we know the average IQ for somebody that graduates high school is 105. So that's a third of a standard deviation above the mean. The average score for somebody who graduates college is 115. So again, one standard deviation above the mean. Now we also know that the concept of IQ doesn't really seem to be linked too close to personality. If you watch some videos I've done before on the five-factor model, the only trait that has a relationship to IQ is openness to experience. There's a facet of that trait called intellectual curiosity or intellect, depending on the instrument. And this has a moderate correlation, small moderate correlation to intelligence and to IQ, but it's not really, we don't look at IQ as really connected to personality that much. We also know around the concept of IQ there's a ton of misinformation. And a lot of this misinformation we see in the media about IQ, and I've also seen this of course in other settings. But one of my favorite kind of misrepresentations is like in the movies where there'll be like an evil genius and the police or the FBI or some law enforcement group will be chasing them and they'll say, oh, their IQ is 190 or 250 or a couple thousand. Well, the maximum score really depends on the instrument, but if you use the WACE, which is one of the most popular instruments, the current version of the WACE has a maximum score of four standard deviations of the mean, so 160. And the minimum score is four standard deviations below the mean, or 40 points. So somebody can't have an IQ score of 190. Now, there are professionals that will predict the IQ. It's called extrapolation. So somebody will score very high, and they'll extrapolate, and they'll try to compute that score that's off the scale. As a matter of fact, with the IQ score, really, when you get into that second to third standard deviation, so that would be 130 points to 145, it already starts to lose a lot of accuracy. So you really can't even trust it at that level. The waste is much better between 70 and 130. So if somebody has supposedly an IQ of 190 or 220, whatever, that's really just made up. And even if it was projected out there by a professional, there's really no way to know how accurate that is. So you think of it like a speedometer on a car. So say you had a car and the speedometer went up to just 50. That's all it would do. So you're driving it down the road and it hits 50 and then you lay on the accelerator some more and you move up to what you think is 55 or 60. Well, that's kind of believable. We think, okay, you can sort of feel that you're moving faster 
than that 50 that you're just at. But if you claim to be going 120 miles an hour, that would be much harder to substantiate based on just feeling the car or seeing the scenery move by more quickly. The closer to the actual limit of the instrument, in this case the speedometer, the more accurate the result would be. So I find this interesting. We see again this all the time in the movies with these really high IQs that are essentially impossible to trust. Now we also see an attitude toward IQ. There's a lot of polarization. People are sensitive about the topic. and I think this is understandable. Intelligence is one of those areas where people don't want to be thought of as less intelligent because that really has kind of a pejorative element to it. And in general, it's just really a touchy topic. But to say that it's not important, that's an interesting claim. And I think given the body of research that's been completed on IQ, that does require some substantiation. Now, what's kind of interesting about IQ is, in one sense, it is very important. And in another sense, it may actually be insignificant. So this is one of those questions that I can kind of answer in both ways. I can kind of say it is and it isn't, and there's evidence in both directions. And it's really just a matter of how you interpret IQ and how you apply it in your life. So I'll illustrate this with an example. So we know that intelligence tends to predict job performance. And the way we think about this is called an effect size. So this is shared variance. So what this means is if you have an intelligence test that is valid, that you can predict a percentage of the variance in job performance, in an instrument that measures job performance. So we know that IQ can predict job performance to some degree and other constructs like educational achievement. So let's use an example here from counseling. Say that you wanted to look at a career in counseling and you wanted to know in advance if there was a likelihood that you would be good at it, if you had a set of abilities that matched what a counselor would have to do. And say that I generated some really simple tests, and this is something I'm making up, but this is a test based on three favorite things. So your favorite color, your favorite type of vehicle, like SUV, sedan, sports car, and your favorite musical. Okay, so you have three questions, and I tell you that this particular instrument will predict 25% of the variance in counseling ability. So you think, okay, 25%, that's a quarter. That only leaves 75% to other variables and error. It's worth it for three questions. So if I were to answer those three questions, I would say favorite color, purple, favorite type of vehicle, pickup truck, and favorite musical, The Greatest Showman. So you answer those questions, and it's scored, and you get some idea of how well you might perform as a counselor if you went through all the training and followed that as a career path. So I'd say, well, is it worth it for three questions to know 25% of the variance? Is it worth it? Sure, that seems worth it. If I said, well, now I'm going to add a few more questions, right? So now it's going to be around 300 questions, and it's probably going to take a few hours. Would it be worth it to know 25% of the variance? Maybe, but now it's a little bit more questionable in terms of, is that a bargain? What if I said, it's still going to take a few hours, but it's only going to predict about 4% of your ability to be a counselor? Then you might say, look, that's just 96% other variables and error. It's not worth it. I'm going to skip the test. Well, depending on the research you look at, IQ predicts about 4% of the variance in job performance. So looking at it from that point of view, you know, is it worth it? It doesn't seem to be worth it. There it looks kind of insignificant. But I said I could argue this both ways. So if it's insignificant in that way, how could it be important? Well, it is important to those that study mental health, and I'll tell you why. 4% is actually pretty good predictive power for the different constructs that we measure in psychometrics. So we know that IQ predicts health, longevity, wealth, and of course, as I mentioned, job performance. And we believe that intelligence in general helps people to adapt to various stressors and situations. So if you look at all the variables that we measure, 4% really isn't that bad compared to other constructs that we're able to accurately measure. So as I mentioned, yes, it's insignificant in some ways, but in other ways, it's actually important. It's one variable among many important variables, and we usually measure a lot at a time to try to predict complex constructs. But intelligence certainly isn't everything. 
There are other variables like I just indicated, emotional intelligence, personality. We have other variables in our society like wealth and really just so many other variables that can be captured that can predict positive and negative outcomes. Intelligence is a powerful predictor among those, but it's not something that alone necessarily has a lot of value. So should you have your IQ measured? Should you go and have a waste administered and know your IQ? Unless there's some really compelling reason, I don't think it's a good use of resources in many cases, especially if someone's already functioning fairly well. If there's a problem with functioning, especially cognitive functioning, talk to a counselor and maybe they'll say an IQ test is warranted. But in most situations, I don't think it makes a lot of sense for people that are doing relatively well already. It's not going to give you information you can really act upon in some meaningful way. So I've more or less answered the question, is IQ important? And at the same time, kind of answered the question, is intelligence important? I would say if we could capture every type of intelligence, if we could really accurately measure all the facets of intelligence, it would be extremely important. But all we can really measure now is this construct of IQ. We really can't necessarily get at the essence of intelligence. So more work needs to be done. But in general, I would say, Again, you can make the argument that IQ is not important and important, but the construct of intelligence, I believe, is important. It's an important strength that people can draw on and that can help them to adapt to a variety of situations. When we're talking about mental health treatment, it's important to draw on every strength that's available. I hope you found this description of the potential importance or maybe non-importance of IQ to be interesting. Thanks for watching.